right, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Today on the show, we have Samuel Sells with me. Sam, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you doing, Jason? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for uh, coming on today. It was fantastic being on uh, your podcast in the past. Yeah, I've been looking forward to talking to you again on, on your pod. This is, um, you know, I... I love, I love people just kind of who've created their own path. Um, and, and you certainly did that. And so it's always fun, um, to talk with, you know, people who are, who are willing to, you know, walk out there into the unknown and, and do something different. No, definitely. Um, well, let's talk about you. Um, would you mind telling the listener more about, you know, who you are and what you do? Yeah. So, um, I, uh, my dad and I started Wild Mountain Capital back, or Wild Mountain Holdings, the parent company, back in 2018. Um, prior to that time, and actually at that time, I was active duty military. Uh, I spent about a decade as an international health specialist, a hospital administrator, working with foreign militaries, foreign governments, helping them develop and create healthcare, uh, sustainable healthcare systems, uh, small, uh, large, um, you know, and and pretty much everywhere else in the world, except for America, uh, healthcare is, um, you know, ran by the government. So the, you know, it's, it, it can be a challenge to align incentives to help people figure out why they should actually provide better healthcare than, you know, than just the very, very, very basics. And so diff- different concepts, uh, anyhow, during that time, I, I've, I've been to the poorest of the poor, uh, countries in the world, Afghanistan, Chad, um, you know, Nepal, a lot of these just incredibly uh, destitute uh, countries. And, and what I think of, um, you know, same thing there, when you can align incentives and, and people see that, that a profit motive can actually help them want to improve their own life and help them improve other people's lives. And there is some kind of prof- profit motive, um, whether you, you hate capitalism or not, it works, right? It, it just works. And so the, uh, you know, I, I came back um, to the States and, you know, was working on a building a big 500 bed hospital and I was just getting worn out. And I said, you know, Hey dad, let's start a company. And we had 80 grand and we put that money together and we bought a mobile home park. And then we went and bought another mobile home park. Um, about six or eight months later, uh, we were making enough, uh, we we're making about twelve thousand dollars a month in free and clear cash flow between the two of us. And we started out with eighty grand, and I was like, mm, "There's something to this," <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I, I've started flipping homes in the early two thousands, like two thousand eight. I was when the, the market crashed. I had two homes that were both on the market. I just flipped them, and so the market crashed. I made it through just fine. We turned one into a, a long term rental. The other one we. Instead of selling it for one fifty, we sold it for one thirty. Uh, I still made forty grand or fifty grand um, because we were buying houses at fifty thousand dollars in downtown San Antonio, right? It's and I lived in Idaho, I was stationed in Idaho at the time, and buying homes in San Antonio. Um, different world back then uh, than there is today, but you know, there's it's <laughs> single family homes. I, once I I left single family, and got into commercial, I immediately sold off everything else I had and, and just stuck with commercial because so much better. Yeah. <laughs> As you know. No, definitely. Um, well, well let, let's dig in more to that. So how did you um, find such amazing cash flow? I mean, starting with 80 grand and cash flow and uh, you said 12,000 a month or a year? Yeah, a month. Yeah. That's insane. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. So tell us more about that. So I found this, um, deal on LoopNet. It was a mobile home park, 42 lots, um, selling for 475. Um, and ironically I've bought some of our best deals on LoopNet. Um, and I just, I have, I have these filters and whenever something pops up that meets a very specific filter, it sends me an email. And if I scroll over it and I can tell him hmm, that's probably a good deal. I call immediately. And so uh, same thing, it popped up. Um, I called um, and there was probably like 10 people that called that day, everybody wanting to buy this deal. And I just spent a long time building a relationship of trust with the broker. 
Um, and at the end of the day, he says, Sam, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure this, this deal goes to you. Um, as long as you're going to pay whatever anyone else is going to pay. And I said, sure. And so we paid full price for 75. Um, but I bought it on a master lease. So at first he said he wasn't going to sell it on a master lease. Uh, two months later, he sold it to us on a master lease. Um, and I learned about master lease from, uh, the commercial property advisors on YouTube. And, uh, you know, I was, I was stationed in Alaska. I was doing work in South Korea and Busan, um, and flying back and forth uh, to Korea all the time and buying a mobile home park in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And then my dad, um, we got that, we got on, uh, Fifty thousand dollars down for one year lease. Fifty thousand dollars worth of capex. Uh, I refinanced my car. I took out my four hundred one k and obliterated it. I paid the taxes on it, uh, and uh, got a line of credit. And that's how we came up with a hundred thousand uh, dollars because we already spent our eighty grand on the previous mobile, the first mobile home park we bought. And then uh, that last one, we spent 70 grand. We're making 2,500 a month, free and clear. Great. Um, the next one, um, it was breaking even. My dad went out there and rehabbed the homes and rented them out and all that stuff. And about six-ish months, um, that thing was churning out um, a little over $10,000 a month, free and clear. Wow. Uh, just impressive. Uh, it got up to about 12 or so a month. And so we were making about 15 off of two properties. And my dad said, well, I mean, we can just finish here. <laughs> we can just stop. And, you know, ambitious young guy, I guess. But we decided to just keep going. And that's when I found out about syndication because I started trying to figure out how do we put together more money? I've got zero dollars. Um, and uh, and then we, you know, we learned how to syndicate. I, Pulled in some friends that were traveling with me on the airplane, listening to me talk about mobile home parks and all this stuff for, you know, 16 hour flights. And anyhow, <laughs> um, and weeks in Korea and then coming back anyhow. So, you know, friends that joined me and, and we all, you know, sorted it out and we learned how to raise money and we learned how to do it without uh, violating the law. And uh, as they say, the rest was just a really bumpy, rocky road of making a lot of mistakes and figuring things out and, you know, I, the biggest mistake I'll, I'll say right now that I made in the beginning was not partnering with somebody else or not. Now I was in Anchorage, Alaska. There was nobody there that was syndicating. Um, and so I should have paid for a coach in the beginning. Uh, and I think I would have avoided probably two years worth of, um, work learning how to do stuff before I could scale and, and go up to apartments and get bigger and bigger. Interesting. Uh, where were these properties that you uh, purchased? Were they in Alaska? Uh, my first one was in Alaska, something that was close, like 10 minutes from my house. Um, in fact, I still have that um, in a storage lot next door. Uh, I master leased them to somebody else. Great for them. Uh, we did a ground up uh, storage building. We built it. And then uh, I left the military and came to uh, Texas uh, full-time real estate. Um a year and a half later, um, just as we were finishing the build. Uh, so I turned that over to one of my partners. He exited the company, um, wanted to go back to being a healthcare provider, which was great for him. Uh, and then we, I turned master leased at somebody else who finished, uh, leased that whole thing up in like six months. It was fantastic. So now I get a check for, I don't know, six grand a month or seven grand a month on that thing. Wow. And I do zero work. It's fantastic. It's also in Anchorage, which is a long ways away. Um, so I'm glad somebody there is running that place and it's profitable. And we've done a lot of stuff to make sure that he could be successful because I want him to be successful in a master lease situation. I want them to be successful. If they default and walk away, then I want a really nice operating property, but I don't want the property. I want him to be successful because I don't want to do anything. I want mailbox money coming to me. Um, and so that oh. works out. Very cool. Um, so why did you decide to, um, you know, start syndicating? If you had, you know, $12,000 a month coming in, like why did you have the ambition to try to grow, try to get bigger? And, 
the second part of that question is how'd you, how did you learn how to do that on your own? Because usually, um, as you and I know, it, it can be very complicated. It can be very tough to learn on your own. A lot of documents, a lot of laws, regulations. Um, yeah, so excited to hear about that as well. I began to spend an insane amount of time. So I, um, I've i always been um, drawn to just working my guts out. It's just kind of what I did, which made me a good military officer, made me, um, you know, that guy who just got all the extra jobs. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's just kind of who I am. So I, I work from the moment I get up and uh, I have to carve out time specifically to play with my kids and spend time with my spouse. Uh, if not, I would just continue uh, working. Um, I, I don't have, a, I don't allow myself to have a lot of idle time. So what I was doing is I'd get up at four o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning and I would work until I left at work at 630. On um, my drive to work, I'd listen to podcasts and you know, YouTube videos and everything, get to work at a hospital, 120 bed hospital where I ran a, a section that was very, very busy. And then during the day, I, you know, every once in a while I'd stop and, you know, consume some more information, write down some notes and then go back to the working. And then afterwards I'd go home, spend a couple hours with my family, work a couple hours, say, you know, good night to all the kids, hang out with my wife. She goes to bed. And then I work for another couple hours um, <laughs> in, <laughs> You know, and very, very, you know, just being like every minute of the day is um, programmed and, and allotted. And so uh, in that time, I consumed a lot of books. I did a lot of um, talking conversations with uh, various folks trying to learn everything I could. And it was the absolute dumbest way to do it all. But I did it. Uh, I do not recommend that to anyone um, but it, you know, it, it worked and I've learned a ton in the process doing it that way allowed me to make a lot of mistakes um, that were avoidable. But now I, um, you know, I think Rod Cleef says, you know, it's either success or a seminar. <laughs> so we've had successes that worked out great. And then we had things that we just really screwed up and because we just didn't know, um, you know, and then that's becomes part of my, you know, I, I do coach. Uh, folks who want to get started and, and go, or folks who are trying to make a transition from working as a syndicator to working with institutional partners. That's a transition point in a syndicator's career because um, institutional partners look for different things. They want a different, you know, you need to fit that mold. You fit that mold and then it's easy for them to bring $50 million to do the deal with you, but you have to fit that mold. Right. And so now we've worked with institutional partners. We know what that looks like. Um, we hired somebody from the institutional world to come and work with us. And that's made a huge difference. It's just, it's been, you know, it's been years of trial and error and then getting it right, repairing something in the past, fixing that, and then moving on. I think um, some that the listener really needs to understand is, um, how much work investing in real estate takes, especially in the beginning. I mean, you know, you were spending every single possible waking hour figuring this out, learning how to invest in real estate on your own. And um, I, I think your message is really clear and concise that, you know, you, this is something that you don't have to learn and do on your own. I think so many people try to do that. And um, if someone were to hire, you know, someone like you to transition from being a, a small syndicator to a higher level institutional syndicator, they do it probably 10 years faster than trying to do that on their own. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's just good stuff. Yeah. It's, it's been interesting. Like, you know, the transition from um, retail investors, which is regular everyday folks to institutional, a lot of syndicators never go there because they just don't know. A lot of people don't ever syndicate because they never even heard of the term. They don't know what it means. Um, and then they're like, I don't want to ask people for money. And I didn't want to either. I raised zero dollars before my first syndication. And then I, I raised money and it was super uncomfortable uh, at first. Uh, but there's, like you said, you know, why bang your head against the wall a hundred thousand times, right? So Jason, you were, you know, a broker and, but you learned about real estate from, you know, friends and then mentors, right? That's the way you want to do it. Right, you either either want to hire a coach, or you want you need friends in the space, uh, or you go work for a firm that will teach you how to do it. Like being becoming a commercial real estate broker, 
you knew, uh, you know, when you bought your first deal, you already knew what cap rates were and how to value a project and, yep. you know, uh, vertical or horizontal or blah, 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 you know, you already knew all that stuff. And so it was a very easy transition at that point uh, versus myself. That's like, I can't buy a, I can't buy a 150 unit apartment complex. And now I do, I have, I have a 245 unit complex, right? And most of the money in that deal is my money. That's crazy. It's awesome. Uh, you know, years ago, I, I never would have thought that could happen. But yeah, it can. So um, I'm, I'm personally curious myself. Uh, when do you think it's the right time for someone to level up from just raising capital from private investors to, you know, taking that next level to family offices and institutional groups? Yeah, it, it really kind of de- um, it really depends on your um, experience. Right. Um, we did one 245 unit deal and that was a mix of institutional and retail. Um, and then the next one was full institutional. Um, and th- so that's kind of how we did it. But I also, I hired somebody out of the institutional world to come help me do it and paid him, you know, a, a nice salary plus bonuses. Uh, it would have been a lot cheaper if I just would have hired a coach instead of, <laughs> you know, hiring him. But, you know, now then I learned about the world of equity brokerage, right? Um, people that source and deals. And then there's the underwriting is different. Uh, you're not doing these um, manager promotes and all this other stuff. It's the, the numbers are all different. But for example, I bought, or we bought a 180 unit heavy value add in Fort Worth, Texas at closing they brought $5 million. We brought $500,000, 90-10 split. And at the end of our 10-year hold, um, the total return over that 10 years to me is over $7 million. So my 500 grand turns into $7 million in 10 years. That's wow. the power of partnering with institutions, but you, you have to have your own dollars in there. And you have to have a track record um, that can show that you know how to operate. Institutions prefer vertically integrated operators. You have your own property management company. You have your own stuff. Because if you have your own property management company, you have your own whoever. Uh, Now, not all of them are like that, but the majority that I've talked to are like that. Um, Because they know everything's in-house. And if you screw up the deal... If your property manager just screwed up the deal, you're toast. You got nobody to blame, right? <laughs> uh, also, if um, you're vertically integrated, you cut costs quite a bit. Um, as long as you have uh, sufficient units. If you're if you're lower than 2,000 units, you don't want to have your own property management company. It's not worth it. You're not going to make any money. Um, and so there's just like little... Uh, levers you need to pull um, and either you want to get on track to go that route and say, okay, I want to close a deal with an institutional partner. I'm not a very good, you know, retail raiser. I don't want to shake my booty on the stage. I don't want to dance in front of uh, TikTok all day to get people to come talk to me and invest. Um, Then that's a route you can go. (laughs) And once you go zero to one um, and we, you know, we help facilitate that. Um, that process of going zero to one, that's the most difficult one. Once you do that once, you prove yourself with that partner, give it six months, a year, then it's just going to be an easy check, right? Would you, do you prefer to uh, raise money from one institutional capital or do you prefer to work with retail investors? I've heard mixed things that like sometimes institutional partners are a pain in the ass. Um, Your fees are a lot less. Is that mm-hmm. true or false? Or So I, I really like our institutional partner. Uh, we have a great relationship with them. Have things gone wrong? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, there's always surprises uh, in multifamily. Always surprises, right? You, it's just, you know, <laughs> it just is. It's the um, game. Yeah. It's the game, right? And you play as well and as good uh, as you can. Uh, but we performed, right? We more than doubled the net operating income in less than a year. That's performing, 
right? It's not just riding the right wave of rents going up $100 a month. No, we we executed a heavy value add plan and we did so incredibly well. Um, yeah, hang ups, little things, fix this, fix that, fire that person because they got in a drunken brawl in the street with no clothes on, you know, all right, you're out. <laughs> uh, all that drama aside, it's been great. Uh, will they work with us again? Yeah, they, they've they asked us multiple times, when's our next deal? And, um, you know, we're waiting like a lot of other people are in the market. We're just waiting for things to get a little bit worse uh, before we make our next move. Um, but if you don't like your institutional partner, they're going to be all in your business. Um, expect, you know, twice a week calls and, and the um, fees are less. That is 100% true. Uh, the for, the good thing about retail side, and this is where you want to start for sure, is you get paid more on the front end. Uh, now with the bigger deals, I'm amazed that anyone invest in a really like a $50 million deal. I'm, I wouldn't invest in a syndicator's $50 million deal because the fees are insane. They're charging a million and a half for their acquisition fee. It's their eighth deal that year. Uh, it's going to be ran by a third party property manager. It's going to be run by a third party asset manager. Uh, the uh, syndicator typically has no skin in the game. He says he put a million dollars or $500,000 in there, but it's just investor cash that he got from the acquisition fee that stayed in the deal. So he's got zero ties to the deal and it's huge. Um, hence why I know a $50 million deal right now that is going back to the bank because interest rates sank that deal. And so $10 million worth of investor cash is evaporating. Wow. And rather than the, you know, the syndicator of that fighting to keep it, cause you can, you can go through chapter 11, you can do things. It's hard, difficult. Um, they're not going to do that because they got no skin in that game. And so that's, Crazy. that's my, that's my rub against that big machine early on. Like Jason, you would never do that. If you're, it's your first deal. It doesn't matter if you have $0 in it. That's your baby. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why I think people that try to raise money for their first deal, I highly recommend not doing it because you're not experienced. You've never done a deal before. You're just cutting your teeth. And the only thing that's worse than losing your own money is your friends and family's money. Right. So, um, I think if you're soliciting people on your first deal and you don't even know how, how to operate, like it's just the dumbest mistake I see happen all the time. Yeah. You, you shouldn't do it. You make more money. You're going to have a better life. You're not going to be as stressed. You're going to make less, uh, mess ups. <laughs> if you work with somebody, a partner and I don't, I, you know, for most of us out there, we're willing to take partners on all the time because I already know how a, somebody new can come and bring value to me. Right. And I, I'm, I know you do too. Right. Oh, you want to do this? Great. Read these books <laughs> uh, and do this thing. And then as soon as you can, you know, start speaking the, the language, if, if not, I'm going to tell you things you're not going to have any idea what I'm talking to you about. And so, you know, read this, do that. And let's do, you know, week, you know, weekly calls or whatever. And then I'll get you in on this deal. Um, you should probably invest in a deal the first time as a passive investor and, you know, see how that works and, you know, that process um, before you jump in both feet. Um, ideally, like us, we cut our feet with our own cash and then the bank's cash. Um, and then we raise cash. And really, I wish we wouldn't have. Uh, I wish we would have just partnered with somebody who had done a bunch of deals, figured it out. Um, and we raised cash for their deal and became part of their deal with them and then learned how they did the systems and the reporting and, you know, learn which accounting firm they're using and legal firm they're using. I mean, all these tricks, they're not even tricks, they're just experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it just saves so much time and effort and pain. For sure. If, if someone's watching this show and they're wondering how can they start in real estate? How can they add value to someone like you? Um, you know, what's one piece of advice you give to that person? Um, uh, you, there's a, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a list of books out there 
that I provide folks all the time. Here's, you know, the top three, my top three books that will actually teach you about syndication. Um, reach out to me. I'm happy to, to share those. Um, there's no fee. They're not my books or somebody else's books. Um, and, you know, and then, and then start a conversation. Now, you don't want to be um, a time drag on, on uh, syndicators or operators, particularly if they're an, actually an operator, because then they are, it's a good chance they're working a lot. Um, if you're just a capital raiser, there's a good chance you got a lot of free time. Uh, you don't make as much money. You make a lot more money as an operator, but you work for that. You work a lot. And so the, um, you know, there's different tracks to take and so forth. But my number one recommendation would be reach out, start building that, um, that knowledge base, and then reach out and find a coach or a mentor or somebody who can help you from yourself. Got it. Um, and then if, if someone's looking to, what, what are one, like, what's one of those books you recommend? What's like the number one book you recommend? Yeah, I think um, Joe Fairless um, and those guys at, at Best Ever did a really good job with their Best Ever Apartment Syndication book. Is it all encompassing? No, but it goes through the basics of syndication. It'll teach about cap rates and, you know, the, the math, which is really simple. You just don't know it unless you do this. Um, and then you can start looking at an apartment complex and say, well, that's a class A. It's probably doing this and it's probably at this cap rate. So you can look at that building and come up with probably a pretty good idea of how much that building is worth without ever going in, without ever talking to anybody. Right. Jason, I'm sure you drive down the street and you're like, hmm, 96 million, 5 million. I want that one as a dump or, you know, whatever, you know, you're yeah. just like, yeah. right. I mean, it's, it's so ingrained in you now. You just, you just know it. Um, and you know, you got to learn that language. If you're going to go to med school, all med school is, is learn the language and these are the parts of the body. And then this is what they're called. The actual activity is not difficult. It's all the, the knowledge, getting the knowledge in your head so you can talk, um, intelligently, um, and not screw it all up or kill people. Uh, same thing with real estate. It's uh, commercial real estate. It's the knowledge, the language, and then you know, how do you actually do things? And more importantly, who do you do those things with? Yeah. The execution. Um, what markets are you, um, before the show, you said you were in several markets or maybe on the show. Um, you know, we're not seeing that much pain here in Southern California where I invest, uh, just cause, um, it's a pretty resilient market, but, uh, happy to hear where you're kind of seeing opportunities coming up in the future or where you're currently investing right now. Yeah, I, th I think um, uh, there's a lot of instability and people are keeping it quiet. Uh, but I know there's two towers in uh, LA that are now uh, in default status on their note. Um, a big one in Chicago just uh, was foreclosed on a $256 million note on that property and that got foreclosed on. So these are big players that are losing properties right now. Um, it's not 2008, um, but um, it just depends on how things go. So we are in Texas. Uh, I prefer the Texas Triangle, um, Houston, San Antonio, uh, Austin, Dallas. Uh, they just really kind of make a triangle on the map. And if you go anywhere uh, along in that triangle, you're going to find a growing population, um, growing values, growing rents still. I mean, values are depressed everywhere a little bit. Um, I think San Francisco leads the country right now, but that's San Francisco. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, on, on uh, value decline, but these, these big markets, Dallas, Fort Worth, you can buy an apartment complex every single day of the week and never run out of apartments in Dallas, Fort Worth your, the rest of your life. Um, it's just, there's so much to choose from. And that makes it possible for, I mean, it's also the heaviest transacted market, but it just means there's more opportunities for folks that don't have a, a $2 billion portfolio to go in there and buy stuff. Um, and there's, there's sweet spots too. Like I know if it's under 30 million, um, it's a, probably a good retail gig, um, you know, with retail investors because institutionals don't really want to go below, def they definitely won't go below 15 million. That's like the cutoff. 
but the big guys, they want bigger and more expensive stuff. And so you, you kind of weed out the, most of the syndicators because they can't get up to $20 million or $30 million. And at 30, that's where all the big institutions come. So there's a smaller pool of fish swimming after the same uh, complexes. And so we have a pretty good hit rate of uh, sitting in an LOI and actually, <clears throat> actually being able to get a deal in a contract and close in that Got it. price range. Very cool. Sam, it's been uh, fantastic having you on. You, uh, you've got a cool story. You're very humble, but you own a lot of units and you're uh, very successful. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, how can the listener go learn more about you or get in contact with you if they want to maybe uh, get in touch? Yeah, I, um, I do have a coaching course um, on syndicationlaunch.com. Um, I love to tell my students, like, you do this, you're going you're to go bankrupt. Don't do that, right? <laughs> Don't give into the hype. Come back down to earth here and do these methodical things, build out your foundation, and then you're going to make millions or even billions of dollars if you go down this route. Don't do that thing. Get focused. You can also reach out to me, Sam, uh, Sam at Wild Mountain Capital. Dot com. Uh, that's our capital company, wildmountaincapital.com. Go to the website. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Clean Money Sam, where I'm talking about how we invest makes a difference. Invest in real estate, invest in people's lives, in your communities. Um, there's great ways to do that. Um, and yeah, I, I love talking to, to folks. I love um, responding to emails, getting on calls. I do free strategy sessions where I just talk and say, what do you want in life? Okay. Commercial real estate is not for you or commercial real estate is for you, but don't go be an operator because that's, you don't want that. You go this route. Um, and that gives folks a, a trajectory that they, they've they never heard about because they didn't know. Um, and I, I find that's really helpful for folks. And, and then they, you know, and yesterday, sorry, great news. Yesterday, one of my students went full-time uh, real estate investor. So got to give a shout out for him. <clears throat> great that, work. <laughs> that's awesome. Cool, Sam. Uh, any last words of advice before we go? You know, uh, if you're in San Diego, go find Jason, give him a call and try and get some uh, advice. I know you've been doing this for a long time. Um, you made a lot of money, but there's still a lot more to be made. Uh, biggest piece of advice I can ever give someone. Um, and I would give to myself, I'd go back and punch myself in the face and say, Sam, find a partner or a mentor coach for the love of God, go find a coach, mentor or partner um, and save yourself the pain. Great stuff. All right. Well, Sam, it was great uh, getting to know you better interviewing you and uh, yeah, great seeing you again. Yeah. You too, Jason. Thanks. Thanks for having me on the pod.